at the atom with when we look at the the atom which has a number of electrons and a number of, of um, binding energies and transition possibilities and stuff we'll wind up introducing what's called the atomic scattering factor which handles uh, or attracts all, all of those complications okay and that same atomic scattering factor comes up when we look later in chapter three at refractive index and this one minus delta plus i beta the delta and beta have these atomic scattering factors in there so that it's just with all the different uh, electrons and transition possibilities etc it's just way too much to write all the time so we just abbreviate it as delta and beta we'll talk about why the delta one why it's small and two why this is negative why for instance for um, green light red light or in the ultra near ultraviolet this would be 1.5 or something like that in infrared even bigger um, so we'll talk about that when we get there but also this is a minus sign this one's a plus sign in your readings you may see this as a minus sign historically it was written with a minus sign but for the way we're going to write a wave function we're going to write that the wave has some amplitude and an exponential um, uh, minus i um, omega t plus plus cap uh, plus k dot r and it turns out that the plus sign gives you a decaying wave with writing the uh, the wave in that way, so you'll see it. But again, just in case you see it in the literature and it looks odd, this is consistent with the way we do it. And now that my the book has been out for a while, the first edition, a lot of people in the world are switching over to this more proper description. Okay. So yeah, so uh, we're going to wind up. With, in order to understand these things and understand a number of things in the class including scattering we need to start with some equations and these are the maxwell's equations okay and i'm going to write them in a certain manner i'll show you when we get there but they'll be written as if in vacuum with a few with one or a few particles or something else and chapter two it will look with maxwell's equations and we'll look at single objects but in chapter three, we're gonna look at more complicated things, materials, thin layers, thin films. And, uh, and there, uh, what will arise naturally is this refractive index. But they're both gonna be dependent on Maxwell's equations. And in order to study them, study them, we need certain electromagnetic, we need a knowledge of certain electromagnetic relations. So quite a few of you listed chapters one to, th one to three and maybe four, which are the electromagnetic chapters. And that's just sort of the basics of X-ray propagation and scattering. And we're going to cover that pretty well. Um, for instance, Hannah, if you're on, and I know Hannah works more with electrons, electron scattering and uh, related uh, subjects, uh, this will be a good, a good um, summary of electromagnetic relationships and the fact that the refractive index is shown here for x-rays easily transfer you easily transfer all of that knowledge to longer wavelengths visible infrared or whatever so i think you'll find that a number of you will find those lectures useful so here's the maxwell's equations uh, this is a slide made up for the class by andy aquila who's he shown down here and he was in the class years ago he works at slack uh, he works at the Free Electron Laser at Slack, and the last few years we've gone as a class to visit um, LCLS, the, the uh, Free Electron, the X-ray Free Electron Laser at Stanford. But it looks like this year that won't happen. If we get a chance later in the semester, I'll tell you. But anyway, he put together this slide. So these are the four equations, vector equations, and uh, these are written as if in vacuum. So you don't see a refractive index yet. And there's a current J that's represent, and there's a row that's representing all the charges that might be in the medium or the volume that you're looking at. And we'll look at propagation based on this and how it depends on J and rho. And we're going to represent all of our scattering. And when we get to refractive index, it's all gonna come in mostly through J, okay? And so, by the way, if you combine these equations, 
which is uh, a frequent prelim exam, uh, this is the wave equation that you get. So in the book, you'll see in chapter two how to do this. And I'll show you when we get there in just a few steps. But basically, if you combine these things, you get that there is a, this is a, a standard wave equation, okay? This is an operator. This is the electric field. And uh, we've eliminated the magnetic field in terms of the electric field, okay? And this is a, this is a propagation operator. And this is the current density J, which involves the number of particles and their velocity. And for instance, if you have a bunch of atoms, they will have a lot of electrons, but their velocities may be different because of their response, how, how near they are to energy levels, et cetera. Um, so we're gonna use those equations, again, in chapter two for scattering. Uh, single electron, we're gonna define what is a cross section. In order to work with the cross section, we're gonna to have to know what is the incident radiation. It will depend on the intensity, and the intensity we'll find is E cross, uh, e cross H, electric and magnetic fields, and that we will we re refer to as the pointing vector, vector S, but uh, it's just the magnitude of that is the intensity. And this is extremely important that we understand the role of both the electric field and intensity in scattering and high harmonics and all kinds of other things that we're going to do. Um, so, okay, so we'll also, so we'll look at a free electron, single free electron, it's called Thomson scattering. Uh, then we'll look at uh, a bound electron, a single bound electron, just to understand this, this would be Rayleigh scattering. Uh, we'll talk about the blue sky and the red sunset. And then the multi-electron atom, we'll look at that and a number of things come in here, and it depends on how big is the wavelength compared to the size of the atom, the electron distribution, et cetera. And this will be a place where we could also talk about the issue that came up last time about scattering, small angle scattering, large angle scattering, and how coherence will play a role in that. Okay, and this will also bring us into atomic scattering factors, which I've written, for those of you who already know about this, I've written it as uh, with a subscript zero and a prime and a double prime. So this is the real part of the scattering and double prime is the uh, imaginary part. And subscript zero has a special meaning uh, where the wavelength of the light doesn't matter. Okay, so for soft x-rays, it's obvious that could, because the wavelength is much, much larger than the atom. But in the hard x-ray region, we also find that the forward scattering doesn't matter. The wavelength can be as short as you want compared to the atom and the electron distribution in the atom. But um, in the forward direction, something special happens. And again, this subscript zero um, comes, becomes appropriate. And we don't have complicated, um, uh, complicated uh, angular dependencies, okay? So that'll be scattering. And then we'll go over to chapter three and we'll use the same equations, but for J, rather than the current J representing a single particle or a single atom, uh, now we're gonna have many atoms, okay? And they'll all have their own complications which are um, um, uh, embedded in this atomic scattering factor. And we'll find the role of forward scattering becomes very important and that leads us to uh, refractive index as shown here, okay? And uh, we'll make some comments about how you determine delta and beta experimentally by, uh, by obtaining information on the scattering factors, okay? And so for instance, the ALS is a place where these numbers are um, measured accurately at very many wavelengths for many atoms. And that's that website I told you about before. It's run by Eric Gullickson. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Does anyone, would, would anyone like to comment as it's going by? Something that strikes you that's different than you heard before or you, you want me to comment on? Okay, okay so this is, <laughs> it is conveniently adopted from the first uh, version uh, edition of the book, but uh, it's convenient. So chapter two um, is about radiation and scattering. And we're gonna, for instance, if you have a, 
a charge, a single charge, and there's an electric field that makes it oscillate up and down, it's going to radiate a dipole, a dipole pattern. So this is a sine squared pattern. Three-dimensionally, it looks like a donut pattern. And the power radiated by some accelerated charge depends on its acceleration, magnitude of acceleration squared, and this angular distribution, okay? And that gives you a power per unit solid angle radiated. So we're gonna derive that. Um, it's a famous formula in electromagnetics, and if you took a class in electrical engineering or physics, uh, you'd get the same formula. In the one case, it might be for a single electron oscillating to the physics department, but for electrical engineering, it might be in, uh, a bunch of electrons, a current in a radio antenna, FM or AM or something like that, but you get the same formula. And these are some of the formulas that we're going to find, okay? And, and, and now you can see why we start using uh, atomic scattering factors. But one parameter that will come up is what's called the classical electron radius. And it's shown here. And it's a representation of an equivalent size of an electron in the scattering process. And the cross section for a single electron is shown here, okay? So we'll come to all of that. When you look at a single bound electron, it has the same front piece, but it depends on how close you are to the resonances, okay? And so, um, and if you have a lot of electrons in the atom, you have to sum, and you have to sum over the different um, uh, energy, resonant energy levels. And by the way, just multiply through here by h bar to the fourth, and h bar squared squared, and you'll, all of this will be in energy units of electron volts, which is mostly what we'll be using, right? And, and by the way, just let me point out here, notice that if the frequency of the wave, omega, is less than, is greater than omega s, then this is a positive quantity. And if it's, it gets squared here, but you'll, we'll see when, and when we look at the refractive index in a moment, that this is going to matter about whether the refractive index is one minus something or one plus something. So again, now if you have, um, an atom with a lot of electrons, then you have to sum over all of these and you wind up with the same front piece, but you'll have some atomic scattering factor. And the general, it's, it's, um, it has a pretty complicated dependence on what the positions of all the electrons in the atoms, which are moving around. And um, that, this term makes it very hard to do anything analytic. But in certain special cases, this goes to zero and you get this. And the two cases where, where this goes to zero is when the wavelength is very long, so soft X-rays or EUV, this term drops out. Uh, this is K, the wave vector, so two pi over lambda. So uh, for soft X-rays, two pi over lambda makes this small. So if the wavelength is large compared to the radial, um, radial distribution of charges, then this, if that lambda is large, it's two pi over lambda, this, this term goes to zero. It also goes to zero in the forward direction. Okay, so we'll see lots of this. And uh, we'll define what is the scattering cross section. It basically, again, the word scattering means redirection. So energy came in in one direction, goes out in another. And again, this could be billiard balls or electrons and uh, something comes in and gets spread out, we call it scattering. And we'll have questions, is that isotropic and equal in all directions or, or does it have angular peaks and what is the wavelength or energy dependence? So we're gonna define this scattering cross section. P, a bar on the top means it's an average. We're averaging over many cycles, let's say. So, uh, and this S bar, this is the, this quantity here, the average of magnitude of S, this is the intensity, I guess. Over the years, I've started to wonder why I didn't just put intensity there. But anyway, when you see this, it's intensity. And these are the formulas at the bottom that we're, we're going to calculate these things. So there is one thing that we will, we, we will do this. A lot of you responded that you were interested in um, those first few chapters, and we're going to cover these things. And we will have to derive a few electromagnetic quantities, like what, what is this intensity? Where does it come from? mathematically and what are some relationships we're going to use. So you will learn some electromagnetics in this class. It'll be for x-ray wavelengths 
but basically it'll be useful to you at any wavelength. Uh, any questions or comments? Um, what is P? P, oh, I'm sorry, power. I, things are so familiar to me, I didn't say it. So the cross section is uh, the power scattered in all directions divided by the power per unit area, the intensity. This is intensity, it's power per unit area. So this is the total power radiated in all directions. And this is power per unit area. So it, this combination has units of area. So cross-sectional area, okay. Great, thank you for bringing it up. The atomic scattering factors, we'll see what they are, but this is for silicon. Yeah, this is for silicon. And it's showing the real part and the absorptive part. So for instance, let's start with absorption. And the, the units are in electrons. So uh, silicon's got 14 electrons. Okay, so since I'm speaking about the 14, for very short wavelengths, the atom, the uh, scattering by the different electrons is almost independent. And so the, the cross-sectional, uh, the, the atomic scattering factor sort of levels off to 14. It's like the only elect, you, you've got at short wavelengths, high photon energy, the, the oscillation is so fast that um, the binding forces ha have no role. The electrons are just oscillating small amplitude. And the, uh, so this atomic scattering factor, as, as I define it here, goes to whatever the Z is, okay? The absorption on the other hand, when the frequency becomes so large, the finite mass of the electron it cannot follow these oscillations and the absorption starts to drop very quickly. In fact, it goes down as the photon energy, as yeah, the photon energy cubed, 2.5 or 3, it depends on where you are with the resonances, but it drops very quickly. And again, here's that, that website, which you'll need. So here we go to chapter three, and now it's wave, wave propagation. So we'll have combined the wave, the Maxwell's equations to use the wave equation, and we'll write a current density J um, as being a product of the charge minus E, the number density or the electron density, and um, the velocity of the oscillating electron in the electromagnetic field. And that will bring us a refractive index, which will look like this, okay? It'll be one minus something. Um, depending on the, uh, the atom density, that classical electron radius and the wavelength squared. And here's, here's the uh, atomic scattering factor. And so we'll just write this for convenience in the following way. And we'll see in this diagram here, his vacuum, here's some material. We'll look at the reflection properties and we'll see how you get Snell's law immediately out of applying the boundary conditions. And you'll see, we'll look at reflections for different angles. In fact, we'll look at reflections for normal incidence, which is down here. And the reflection for normal incidence is gonna depend on this delta squared plus beta squared. And both of them are very small and, become, and beta becoming very small at X-ray wavelengths. So that's gonna go away. And we'll see about absorption lengths, okay? And Professor we'll Atwood, yeah, please. I have two questions. Um, on the slide before this, those were graphs of increasing like incident photon energy on the x-axis versus how likely the atom or yeah the atom is to scatter. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, again, so this is photon energy incident on a single silicon atom. Okay, and this is showing. The contribution to refraction, the changing of the, the phase velocity, and this is showing the absorption for that, that collection, right? Gotcha. Okay. Um, my second question is about the um, index of refraction. The way that you have it written, um, you're using, there's like an imaginary component, which I've never seen before. Oh yeah, okay, so great question. So yeah, so when, because we're, you know, we often think about my example, frequent example is green light going through or red light going through a window, right? And we, we have reflective, we, we know that there are reflections there. So you diminish the light going through by reflection, but actually in propagating through the glass, let's say through pure silicon, there's, there's hardly any absorption in that wavelength region. 
and in fact, uh, and, the, and the infrared. But as you, but, um, as you get to higher photon energies, um, some of the light is absorbed. And in fact, it can become completely opaque. So for instance, SiO2 for a window is transparent to visible light. But if you look at a silicon wafer, it's really black. It reflects well, but it's black. There's nothing getting through. And that's because there's absorption. So it's just a little shift in the electron energy levels between SiO2 and Si um, can lead to a, a opaqueness. So, so beta is representing what is the, de what is the decrease in intensity uh, of a wave as it goes through some medium. So uh, for many cases for visible light, we don't see much, absor much absorption and we, we just generally write the refractive index as 1.5 for visible light and something more for infrared. But as you get into the ultraviolet, you suddenly find beta becoming really important. So, um, oh, at wavelengths, let's say um, beyond 200 nanometers, okay, when you're getting shorter. So green light is 520 nanometers. And then in the ultraviolet, you're getting to wavelengths like 250 nanometers or 200 nanometers. And all of a sudden, there's a lot of absorption and this term becomes important, okay? Okay, so that's like a way of keeping track of the intensity as we move through the material. Exactly. And we'll see, okay. here's the absorption length. How far do you go before you go to a 1 over E drop in intensity? It depends on the, the wavelength and beta. And beta is this complicated factor. It has, it has the imaginary part of the atomic scattering factor. So if I were to go backwards, uh, it's, this is a the complex quantity, and this is representing absorption, the gamma, okay? Yeah, so these are great questions. These are good things. Okay, so, um, yeah, so we'll also, so we'll look at the boundary, boundary problem. So we have some material, refractive index we figured out. For certain wavelengths, we'll know exactly what this is. Uh, I should say photon energy, we'll know exactly what this is. We'll have some, angle of incidence, which for visible and infrared light, we normally consider angles measured from the normal, but it turns out that because absorption is so strong for x-rays, we wind up um, switching over to the angle measured at glancing incidence, okay, which I'll call theta. So these are orthogonal, okay? And when we apply the boundary conditions here, which again are exactly out of any electromagnetics book you had. So Griffith's or um, um, Jackson's book or anything like that. You'll, we're gonna be solving the exact same equations and you, you just have to replace what you already know if you've been through this, just put in the refractive index we've got for x-rays and you'll get all the same things. And so one of the things we'll find out just from the continuity along the boundary condition we'll get that the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection, which we've known since high school. And we'll get for the refracted wave, we'll get Snell's law. We just get that so simply just by saying whatever the boundary condition is, it has to be continuous along this interface. Okay, so we'll get those two things and we'll use them. But Snell's law with our refractive index, as we've been talking about it, plugged in, I don't wanna go through the algebra now, but we will later and it's certainly in the book, we'll find out that um, there, there, is, there, is, um, there is some angle, it's a very small angle, a few degrees, it depends on if you're w working with x-rays or, or soft x-rays or ultraviolet, there'll be some small angle here, let's say for x-rays it'd be a fraction of a degree, soft x-rays a few degrees, there'll be some angle at which you get near total reflection. So this arrow will come up, this arrow, the reflected wave, you know, because the angles are incidence and reflection are equal. So it'll be a kind of shallow thing like this. And the wave going into the, material, into the material is the refracted wave. Now, if you remember from whatever background you had with optics, really going back to high school, when the refractive index was 1.5, no beta, and this was not negative, but positive, the refracted wave bent towards the normal. So it would have gone up here somewhere. Okay. 
but because our ref and we would have a thing called total internal reflection you've seen it in fish tanks and you've seen it in swimming pools if you put your head under the water there's a total internal reflection inside the water but for us with a refractive index of one minus something where the light is going to bend the other way and so you can see that as you bring the incident ray up so it's coming here at a shallow angle at some point the refracted wave will be running right along the surface and if it's running right along the surface there won't be much penetration into the material and absorption will dive and so um, so for instance i mentioned it briefly before but when we look at normal incident light coming in at normal incidence we would have found we found we will find that the reflection coefficient was delta squared plus beta squared over four it was extremely small because delta was like maybe 10 to the minus two or even smaller and maybe 10 to the minus four so if normal incidence reflection for x-rays is essentially zero but coming in at glancing incidence, it can be very large. It approaches 90%. And that angle, the angle, we call it the critical angle. It's a small angle where the incidence angle is small and the refracted ray drops right along the interface. It's propagating along the interface. It's only weakly uh, penetrating the material. It's an exponential amplitude dependence into the material. And in fact, if you come in, so we call that the critical angle. Where is it here? Theta critical. Uh, I'm sorry, I want theta critical. So this is phi, but we want to work with theta because the angles are smaller. And you just go through a little algebra and we'll find that, that this critical angle is square root of two delta. So for instance, there's an example here at one kilovolt, the soft x-ray. Um, we look up refractive index in that web page I told you about, and we'll find out what is delta, it's small, and what's the critical angle, 3.7 degrees. So that's soft x-rays, and it's a high-Z material, gold. If you go to harder x-rays, um, delta is going to get, remember it was dropping very quickly in the x-ray region, and these angles are going to go to much less than a degree. So, okay, so you're already getting a flavor of some of the phenomena that we're going to observe that are commonly observed with x-rays. Uh, we'll go through these in more detail, but you're sort of getting an introduction to this. I also want to mention uh, scattering in the sense, when we do scattering, I, want, I don't want to stop on it here. We'll find that there's a scattering diagram that you can use in so many cases, and it's not just for x-rays or visible light, for electrons, whatever you want you'll find that if there's some periodic structure uh, which you can represent with some k vector okay it has some oscillation here so there's a there's a wavelength if you will a, a way th this is like a wave it could be a crystal where these are very sharp or something like that uh, the planes where the atoms are but let's just say it's distributed in some way with incident light coming in scattered going off in some other direction you can make you can write this as a scattering diagram and we'll do it where the periodicity here is represented by i've written it as a k vector with a subscript d meaning a periodicity d okay so k is 2 pi over d it has a directionality so that's a unit vector and you'll get this scattering diagram and this is such a powerful little diagram so for instance you can get bragg's law we will show that you get bragg's law out of this immediately this could be a sound wave propagating it could be light uh, light scattering off a sound wave or a plasma wave so for those of you who are interested in plasmas uh this could be brillouin or raman scattering or stimulated brillouin or raman scattering uh, would all be covered by this really simple diagram where these are all two pi, two pi over lambda, the incident wave vector, two pi over s, the scattered one. It's, if it's isosceles, as it's shown in here, if this thing is not moving, it's stationary, then these both have the same frequency. You know, if this thing was moving, there'd be a Doppler shift, so there'd be a little frequency shift. But if it's stationary, like in a crystal, these are, these are both gonna be the same. And the, here they're going to be the same. I've just manipulated the vector orientations. Uh, these are going to have the same amplitude. It's a it's an isosceles triangle, and as a result, you would get the Bragg equation. And we'll find it just useful in so many situations beyond this class. Now, anyone want to comment? Okay. 
Uh, so for instance, here's a, what's called a multi-layer mirror. This is the, the short version of it. It's, a, it's an interference effect. It's a bunch of layers, uh, let's for x-rays or AUV, these are going to be layers that are, you know, nanometer periodicity. The, 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 uh, so this is an SEM, by the way. Um, an SEM looking at a thin side view of a layered structure, which is, which is from a mirror. And the D spacing here, it says 6.7. It's supposed to say nanometers. Maybe I'll get to fix that. And there are 40 layer pairs, okay? And for instance, you would have X-rays or EUV, let's say, coming in at some angle and bouncing off. And typically, we've said the reflection coefficient <coughs> is pretty small in this wavelength region. But in the EUV, it's not so small. And you still have a lot of absorption. But these multi-layer mirrors, um, interference coatings, I would call them, multi-layer interference coatings, and they satisfy the Bragg condition also because it's a periodicity, stationary, it's not moving. There are small differences, which we'll talk about, but basically light comes in, it propagates in, reflects off each interface, and there's a positive interference of all of those reflections off all of those layers. And there's some other effect here, which we'll talk about later, the Borman effect, which can wind up leading to a really high ref reflection, even at some other angles. So some people call them artificial crystals, okay? And the title here, which probably is a little hard to, to, uh, to read, but it's get, uh, people have gotten 70% reflectivity at 13.5 nanometers. And this is what's called the enabling technology for EUV lithography. Without this particular mirror, there would be no EUV lithography. And I think Moore's law would be um, history, okay? In fact, Moore's law has been history for the last few years. It's just with the emergence of EUV as a viable way to print computer chips, but it is all based on uh, molly, this is a molybdenum silicon coating. Again, I don't see if it's in the title. Um, it's a molly silicon coating and uh, it gets a real high, and so they put this on the optics, on mirrors. And so they've gone from refractive, printing computer chips with refractive optics to, com to now, just now, just in the last year, printing the latest computer chips with, um, with this uh, reflective optics based wholly on, on this thing. So computer chips were, you know, um, probably when you were in high school, they were made with visible light and then with ultraviolet light and then further and further into the ultraviolet um, um, uh, 248 uh, nanometers and then 193 nanometers. And then beyond 193 nanometers, if you went shorter, the absorption was so severe, it, it dealt an end. And there was no longer an ability to continue Moore's law and going to smaller features, okay? But with a big jump going from refractive optics to reflective optics, this is it. And this was, this uh, you may find interesting, it's from Sasha Bate. Uh, she was at the time at Lawrence Livermore. There was a big initiative between Bay Area, it was a Bay Area initiative to make EUV lithography a real option. This was in the early 1990s. And uh, it involves a lot of companies, Intel, AMD, all kinds of others, and uh, three national labs and one university, UC Berkeley. We were the only ones providing lots of students opportunities to do research and they did this. And Sasha was working at the time at Lawrence Livermore. Now she's in Germany at the, at the, um, at the Center for Free Electron Lasers at Daisy Lab in Hamburg. But uh, Sasha obtained this nice, re this result with 70% reflectivity, which is, was a world record and remains very, very close to the world record. And about a week later, she had a baby. So she was there, a soldier to the end. And that little baby is now, uh, I guess, uh, is a freshman in Cologne. Okay, so here, well, here's an example of a crystal. So we're not gonna talk much about crystals. There are other classes that do that. But we will talk about it a little bit because we use them a lot and we use them in our monochromators for hard x-rays and many other ways. And also because of understanding the scattering uh, process, it helps us. 
okay okay oh here's the scattering diagram i had forgotten i put this in here but in maxwell's equation there was a current density j and this is how we'll write the current density j in general and n and v um n is the let's say the atomic density or it could be the electron density but let's say it's the atomic density or it's the density of some sort of atoms which have a certain resonance or something like that but let's say it's, it's some period periodic electron density it could have multiple periodicities and then we'd have some Fourier analysis to handle this okay but there's an let's say an electron or atomic density which is periodic uh, so this could be in some molecules or something like that and then there's a velocity and the velocity is the velocity due to the oscillation there's an electromagnetic wave coming in there's some process in the medium and then each of these uh, every electron feels this incident radiation through the electric field and it oscillates and when it oscillates it radiates and then those all of those emissions get summed but we represent the velocity here by this term okay this is the this is um, uh, the equation of motion f equals ma would be mass times acceleration equals minus e times the electric field and so um, for a certain for a wave that's oscillating like this this is our incident wave it's oscillating at a frequency omega this velocity and the accelerations associated with it etc bring this brings in this term the electron density or atomic density brings in something like this there may be a, a scattering factor associated with that and so this from this we would get Bragg's law and all kinds of other things and in fact when you look at this the solutions that are going to appear in Maxwell's equations with this as the driving term on the right we're going to have to match amplitudes to find the amplitude of the scattering but we can also look at the frequency components and the k components and we'll find that we have we have to match the frequency the amplitudes frequencies and wave vectors and in order to this equation to hold for them to be an equal sign everything's got to be the same and so this omega s has to be equal to omega i plus omega d and the k's etc so this is where there could be a little doppler shift or no doppler shift if it's a crystal but it could be something moving a plasma wave acoustical wave and the wave vectors that's this so uh, if there's little doppler shift then this is this Will be small and these two will be isosceles and this is where we get our scattering diagram that i, I mentioned to you and we could look at that uh, for a crystal we have a crystal here and we'd find bragg's law ah, so this brings us to the introduction of coherence okay so this is a um a marching band they have musical you can see flutes in some hands and other instruments and musical instruments but uh, and this was um this is a photograph taken at the inaugural parade in 2009 which was um barack obama's uh, okay and there's a person over here who's calling what's called a cadence so these people are marching and you notice that they're all putting their right foot down at the same time and their left foot is up so everywhere you see they're all they're marching like soldiers um, kindly my wife replaced the picture of soldiers with nice marching band but you can see so in that sense if you were looking at, uh, and these this guy over here is calling cadence so he's making some repetitive sound you know hut 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 something or whatever he wants and these people know that they should put a certain foot down at that time so there is a sense of coherence here these people are all stepping they, there's a phase associated there's a cycle of which foot is going down and when's the other foot going down so there's a cycle there but they're all in phase they are all doing it at the same time so it's we could use the phrase coherence if you look if you look up the word coherence in the dictionary you'll find that it, it implies a relationship between things that are happening so it'll give an example of optics 
the wave waves propagating with a, a certain sort of wave motion where all of the participants, atoms or electrons or water molecules in a water wave, they're all oscillating with some frequency and importantly, with the same phase, okay? So this we would call, I don't know what to call it, but coherent stepping, let's say, or marching, I guess coherent marching, okay? Imagine that it's windy, so that when this guy calls the signal, the people close to him can hear him well, and maybe there's a directionality because of the way the wind is blowing, and maybe there's a, a noisy crowd nearby cheering. Uh, the people near him might be stepping in phase as they're supposed to. People further away can't quite hear it, it's too noisy, and they might start to get a little out of phase, and the further you go, more out of phase. This brings up the idea of a coherence length. There's some distance where everybody's in phase, and then it's not so good in phase, okay? And you get further away and it's out of phase. It's just completely random, they can't hear anything. So for us, we're, this is an introduction to the ideas of coherence. It has to do with over what distance there's a, um, a continuous phase and in which, at what distance does that start to break down and become what we would call uncorrelated or incoherent. So uncorrelated will go with coherence, correlated motions go with coherence. And we'll speak, speak about waves propagating probably the next slide. Let me look. Yeah, so here's some wave. It's a spherical wave that's propagating. Maybe there's a lens in here that converts it to a plane wave propagating along. Okay, and these are very nice smooth um, uh, spherical wave fronts that are propagating or, or plane waves. These are the phases of a plane wave. And um, if you uh, if the waves are perfectly smooth, as they're shown here, you know, spherical wave fronts, then if you, measured, if you measured the phase of the wave here, you could predict very accurately what the phase of the wave is here. And coherence is mathematic, mathematically descri described in terms of the probability that you can um, you, if you know the phase in one point, you'll know the phase at another point. So if you have beautiful uh, spherical wave fronts like this, the wave will, be, will have a high degree of coherence. If the wave fronts are very wobbly, okay, because it wasn't a single point source that produced these spherical waves, but it was a bunch of point sources which were separated from each other, maybe they're even moving, then these wave fronts are gonna be a little messy. Okay, and the ability to predict will be good if the two points are close, but if the, if the second point is too far away beyond the coherence length, you won't be able to predict with any accuracy what the phase would be. So, uh, and the same thing here, in when, if, this is, if there's a lens and it converts this to plane waves, so these two points are shown here. And generally, we're going to be dealing with x-rays, which are propagating in a relatively well-defined direction. So there's a directionality of our incident radiation and maybe the outgoing radiation. And so when we look at these two points, we'll find it convenient to talk about spatial coherence, meaning lateral in the transverse plane. How good is the, co if you knew the coherence here, if you knew the electric field here, how well could you predict it here? Okay, and also in the propagation direction, if you knew it here, how well would you know it here? Well, this lateral or spatial coherence um, well, uh, depends on the size of the source and the angle of, of the emission. Whereas this one, the distance in the propagation direction, it's like a spectroscopy issue. It depends on how broad is your spectrum in wavelength or photon energy? What is the spread? So the coherence length in the propagation direction is, I write it as a coherence length. It's lambda squared over two delta lambda, where delta lambda is the spectral width of the source. So maybe this point source was oscillating up and down, but maybe, um, for instance, maybe it wasn't a pure oscillation at a single frequency, maybe it had some spread to it. So that would show up in this distance, this coherence length. Okay, by the way, I should say, this is one of the more difficult 
subjects for discussion in x-rays or, or in visible light, actually, uh, of uh, this issue of coherence, how to understand it, how to measure it, how it affects what you're, what you're measuring. Anyway, we'll find it convenient to break it up into coherent, spatial coherence and temporal coherence, mainly because our wave is propagating in a certain direction. And so if there were wavefront variations here, you know, you can imagine here you dropped one pebble in the water and it produced nice spherical waves. But suppose you dropped a handful of pebbles in here. This would be a mess. These, if the pebbles were separated a certain distance, they would all be launching spherical waves, but they would be interfering with each other. And these wave fronts could be slightly perturbed or they could be greatly perturbed. And that would affect this spatial coherence in this direction, okay? Again, in the propagation, it'll depend mostly on the spectrum. So when we get into, um, for instance, scattering, other than scattering off a single object like a free electron or an atom, uh, when we get into more complicated things, these these things um, will matter. And for instance, when you do um, a small angle x-ray scattering or diffraction, you know, we, we know that for instance, diffraction of x-rays from a crystal, you can get up to 95%, but you only get to 95% or 98% if the incident radiation is a well-defined wave like shown here. And in general, uh, for instance, if you're using an x-ray machine, not the case. Okay, and even in synchrotrons, uh, they'll have some degree of coherence, but spatial coherence, but you need to do some tricks, which we'll talk about. Okay, so, um, um, yeah, so, mm -hmm, please. Um, so what is spectral width? Spectral width, oh, I'm sorry. So like mm -hmm. down here, uh, let me just see if it's in the next slide. It is, oh, okay. Here's, here's radiation where there's an intensity and a wavelength of the source of emission, and it has some spectral width. It's not a laser line, which is very narrow, you know, maybe one part in 10 to the fifth or something, but maybe it's more like a light bulb. So the spectral width, the spectrum of light, meaning the wavelengths or frequency content uh, or, uh, is, is wide. So for instance, for a light bulb, this would go from red, orange, yellow, green into the blue. And this delta lambda would be very wide. And if this is very large, the coherence length would be very short. So generally we don't make holograms with white light where this is very broad. So that's the spectral width. Uh, on the other hand, a laser, lasers with a very fine line, which could be something like one part in 10 to the five would be quite typical. So a very narrow line and this makes the coherence length, because this is small, very large. So we can make holograms in the visible light region um, relatively easy. In the x-ray region, we do it also. We'll, we'll look at, at holograms. Uh, I don't know if we'll look at them, but we'll have slides about them, uh, in which we play with, we use a monochromator to narrow this down so that we can get more coherence length for our interference experiments. So that was a partial answer. Did, do you wanna to add to that? Yeah, I think that, so it's basically like the range of wavelength that the light contains. Yes, exactly. Got it, thank you. Yeah, so in the, I said there was a propagation, in the, in the direction of propagation is a coherence length, which depends on the spectrum, the spectral width. In the spatial direction, we'll find that it depends on how big is the source size and what kind of angles are involved. And we'll see a relationship that looks like this, okay? So we'll spend some time on that when we get there. Uh, did anyone else, else wanna ask or comment on coherence? I mean, it's a confusing subject. Uh, it's a, not confusing. It's a challenging thing to get it in your grip so that you understand it and you apply it. Uh, for instance, so this is from Art Charlo. Uh, he was a professor at Stanford and um, he wrote an article in Scientific American, which is not referenced here, but it is, should be, but it's not, but it's referenced in the book. So this was a Scientific American article that he wrote around the time he got his Nobel Prize. And he's showing 
So this would be relevant to, I, I wanna make a hologram in the visible light, but we're gonna do the same trick in the X-ray region. And so he shows a light bulb, which has an extended source so that if I went back a slide, <clears throat> I said there were two parts to the coherence. One was the bandwidth affecting the coherence length in the propagation direction. And there was this other relationship that re involved the size of the source and the angle of emission. Had, has to be roughly equal to lambda. In fact, if you these are exp, these are one over these are RMS quantities. If you did uh, full width half max, this would be simpler. It'd be d dot theta equals lambda over two, in terms of full width. But anyway, it's a d and a theta for spatial coherence. So now when we look here, a conventional light source has got a big d. This is a really big source. And it's radiating out, it's a light bulb. So it's radiating, out, radiating into four pi, basically. So, um, so as far as coherence is concerned, nothing could be worse. This is big and this is gigantic, okay? And for a laser, you wanna get this product to be roughly lambda over two. So he does two things. He does spatial filtering with a pinhole and spectral filtering with a filter or a monochromator. For the x-rays, we'll probably use a monochromator. And so by putting a, uh, a pinhole with a small enough opening size, that means the letter D is small, and confining, it, confining the observation to some finite angle, maybe because you put an aperture here and you only allowed radiation, although the radiation from the light bulb was going all over the place and even out of the pinhole, big angles, you limit it to a certain angle. So going back to that previous relationship, you're controlling D with the pinhole and theta probably with an, an angular aperture, maybe another big aperture here from here to here. So that's controlling the spatial coherence, okay? And then he controlled the spectral coherence with a filter. So he was showing here that this light bulb is emitting both red and black, or maybe it was blue in the original, but anyway, red and black lines for different wavelengths going in all different directions. He controlled the directionality by putting the pinhole and he's putting an absorption filter here so that only one wavelength comes out. So by doing that, he's narrowed this spectral width. So first he put the pinhole for this one and now he put the uh, filter for the bandwidth and he combines the two of them and you get um, really very high quality spatially and temporally coherent radiation. You can use this to make holograms. I've done it. It works super, <laughs> it's super in a sense. You've just killed your power. You might've had a hundred watt light bulb from your house, but you put this little tiny pinhole, much smaller than this, not much light is getting through this pinhole and then you're filtering it and so even less is coming through. So you might have started with a watt of power, but you could very well be here into nanowatts or less, okay? And so his article was about lasers. And in the laser, you actually put the pinhole and the filter inside the laser cavity and you only, and all of the power comes out spatially and temporally coherent, if you do it right, actually. It's not all lasers have all those coherent properties, but good lasers do. And um, it's, a, it's a topic that's generally of interest to people. So when we get there, there are lasers that, uh, in the X-ray. The free electron lasers are the only truly X-ray lasers, but there are la laboratory scale atomic X-ray lasers, and they're interesting. I don't think, Anyone has shown interest in, in the comments you gave me, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but I did think I'd at least show you what exists. It's all in the EUV, and I'd use that as an excuse to tell you how a laser works. So I just find that many students go on and you take quantum mechanics and all kinds of electromagnetics and optics classes, but sometimes nobody tells you how a laser works. So I'll put a couple of slides in. In fact, the next one, Oh, well, it jumped ahead. Um, so when we get there, I'll, I'll also speak about lasers. So then we'll get in. So the first four chapters of the book were about electromagnetics and um, scattering refractive index and coherence, okay? Now the next part is about sources of radiation. So we'll talk about synchrotron radiation, 
which has two component, uh, two main sources. A so-called undulator, which is shown here, uh, which is, you might use at the ALS or other synchrotron facilities. These undulators produce radiation, uh, which is very intense. Uh, you, it's amazing. You can get, uh, you know, tens of watts. Uh, you can get more than that. You can get tens of watts out of these things in, certain, in a relatively narrow bandwidth. And, or you can have bending magnet radiation. We'll talk about that. Mostly we'll talk about undulator radiation, but we'll at least mention bending magnet radiation. Um, some of you, I think, are already using the ALS or APS or even Spring 8 in Japan. So some of you already have some experience. But um, generally, the mathematical presentation to calculate the power in this little cone of radiation, I find it's just too complicated. It requires way too much background in um, uh, relativistic electrodynamics. But we're going to find that there's a way to analyze this, which is so simple, and it uses information we already have. And we'll get all the properties we want of undulator radiation. Uh, if you make one of these, and these, for instance, at the ALS, a typical undulator would be three or four meters long, with a period here of a few centimeters. And the electrons come through, they're highly relativistic, but they feel a periodic magnetic field. Notice that the arrows are down, up, down. So when the electron comes through, it feels a Lorentz force, a V cross B, where um, the magnetic field, the B, is up, but the velocity is this way. So V cross B is out of the plane, and you get a little oscillation. Whenever a charge oscillates, it radiates. If it, and it radiates in all directions in general. But if it's relativistic, that broad angular content is thrown into a really small forward angle, shown here. So that's undulated radiation. We'll get to understand that actually quite well. Um, based on knowledge that we already have. If you make this undulator very long, rather than three or four meters, make it a few hundred meters long, you can get what's called free electron lasing. What happens is uh, in, in the undulator, let's say, I'll just show this here. Uh, this is a short undulator. It's showing meters, 20 meters, but you have a bunch of electrons coming through, not one, but you have a, maybe a bunch with say 10 to the eighth or 10 to the ninth electrons in the bunch and they go through and within the bunch, they're all randomly located and with a short undulator, when they exit, they're still um, randomly um, positioned and they have motions and stuff like that. And so as a result, you get a certain amount of radiation here, but coherence matters a lot here. Uh, what happens is that if you make the undulator long enough, the electric field that you're producing in the, the radiation here becomes strong enough that it starts to feed on the motion. It starts to affect the motion of the particles in the bunch, which wasn't happening in just a few meters. It just wasn't enough distance and time for these effects to happen. But with the Outcut with this radiating wave, it's actually moving with the electrons. They're all going at the speed of light. The photons are going at the speed of light, but the electrons um, here are almost at the speed of light. In fact, they're only different from the speed of light by, again, something like one in 10 to the eighth or one in 10 to the ninth. So you can go a long distance where the wave and the particle are moving together. And as a result, you'll see the physics comes out quite nicely. The, Equations are not all that complicated, but the physical understanding will, ha will have good diagrams. You'll start to see a modulation appear in this random bunch until there's a high degree of orderliness in the electron. The, ele the, el the electron bunch, the electrons within the bunch will look like an electron wave. Okay, and because of that, in the forward direction, their radiations will all add coherent which didn't happen here. Here, in the undulator with these random electron motions and they're moving around, they're not in phase with each other. They're in phase, out of phase. They wind up radiating independently. And the amount of power out depends just on how many electrons were there, 10 to the eighth, let's say. But here, where they all get in phase, now the electric fields add. 
and power goes, radiated power goes as the electric field squared, which we'll learn about in chapters two. And so the power jumps up gigantically. And so what might have been a power radiated in a simple undulator of a few meters might have been 10 watts or something like that. This is gonna go up to gigawatts, okay? So FELs will be of interest. Um, the pulse durations here, Usually the measurements here are not time resolved, although they could be. There are many electron bunches in here and people usually just run for seconds of exposure. So there's no real time resolution. It's possible, but not, not much. But here, these pulses come out with femtosecond, maybe 10 femtosecond would be a typical number or 30 femtoseconds. Pulses of radiation, okay? Really interesting also is high harmonic generation or laser high harmonic generation, completely different, where you have a laser radiating uh, relatively short pulses, say in the femtosecond region, and powerful and a high, decent rep rate shows here at kilohertz. Um, these would have been at 400 megahertz, and these are mm, of order 100 hertz, okay? Uh, here with it's shown here with a laser, a Thai sapphire laser, which is a common laboratory tool. And um, that light uh, is brought down by a focusing lens onto a collection of gas atoms, usually inert gas atoms. So helium, neon, uh, et cetera, krypton. And when you do that, these um, this is brought down to a relatively high intensity, not too high. This is where intensities, again, will really matter to us. The intensities here will be a few times 10 to the 14th watts per centimeter squared. It matters a lot that they not be too much less than that and they not be too much more than that. Uh, but at any rate, within that uh, parameter region and a certain density region, the electric field will become intense enough that it actually pulls electrons off the atom, in, in a half cycle, it'll go up and away from the, it'll be pulled off and will go away from the atom, maybe a few nanometers, and then come back, come crashing back. It may miss the atom, the, the left behind ion, but it may hit it. And if it does hit it, there's a recombination and it's a lot of energy. The electron, when it was pulled off, gains energy in the electric field of the laser and so when it returns, it has a lot of energy, plus the binding energy that it lost going out. So it comes back, it has a lot of energy. So this could be like 30 EV, 50 EV. It can be quite higher than that, but that would be a more typical thing. So an electron would go off and come back and collide with the parent ion at 50 EV and throw off photons. And with a lot of gas atoms there, these, they, uh, the radiation adds in the forward direction. It is coherent. And you wind up, here is shown the red arrow is the incident light going through the gas and most of it continuing, but having produced some extreme ultraviolet or soft x-ray region, region shown by the purple. Okay, and then you put a filter there to block the whatever ray wavelength the incoming light was and just pass this. And this radiation, uh, it's periodic. And uh, by the way, shown here in a larger view. And so um, it's periodic and it winds up coming out in harmonics, harmonics of the incident laser light. And you pick certain harmonics to do your experiments. So the chemist in the, in the, in the class will be quite familiar with the fact that um, these pulses, you can pick a harmonic which has uh, a certain photon energy which relates to the atoms or the molecules that you want to probe. And the, 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 although the incoming pulses may be femtoseconds, the outgoing pulses can be attoseconds. So students in this class in previous years published papers with 80 attosecond pulses. In fact, the first publication of really sub femtosecond duration uh, involve two students from, from Berkeley, from this class, one from chemistry and one from AS and T. Okay, so that's, those will be the, the main three sources that we'll, we'll talk about. Uh, there's also plasmas. So plasmas, uh, if the temperature is high enough, they'll produce 
also a lot of x-rays. And if they're dense enough, they'll produce enough x-rays that we can measure something. So we use the phrase hot dense plasmas, and we will talk about that. So uh, four of the students from nuclear or students working up, up at the hill at LBL with Bella, the FEL, will be interested in plasmas. And there are other people, including <coughs> nuclear and mechanical engineering in the class, who are interested in plasma physics. So there'll be some reason for us to talk about plasmas. I'll show you a few slides in a moment. But there'll also be some interest in the uh, usefulness to the chemists who are interested, or anyone who's interested in high harmonics, because the limitation on how long of a propagation path you can have, and therefore how many atoms are radiating coherently and together, there's a limitation on this source, and it's because when you pull the electrons off the atoms, you wind up with a lot of free electrons. It is a plasma, okay? It's a low electron density plasma, but it's, it's, has an effect and there's a frequency, a refractive index, which is also one minus something. And it winds up producing a, uh, uh, a defocus so that the radiation coming in will be turned away to larger angles. And this will limit how much power you can get out. So the high harmonic people uh, would be interested in a, what is the plasma refractive index, which is limiting this? And I'll show you, we could do it in complicated ways, but I'll show you a way where you get Maxwell's equations, you write J the right way, and you'll get the refractive index of a plasma uh, within a few lines, certainly less than a page. So we'll talk about that. So there's some interest in different groups within the class on plasmas, and I want to give them enough attention on this, but other people are not interested. The larger part of the class is not interested in plasmas but we'll work together. This is, might be where the class projects come in, where we can have class projects which focus your attention on the plasma physics. And, uh, uh, and I can get, uh, we can also meet for extra lectures on some of the details of the plasma physics. So there's a lot of interesting things in plasmas. Most of the class is not interested. Let's figure out among those of you who are interested in it, how we can provide the kind of background that you want. So there's also this issue of atomic lasers. I'm going to show you, uh, no one has shown an interest in it and the feedback you gave me, but so I'll just show you a little bit on that, okay, on how they work, and again on how laser works in general. So this gets us now into synchrotron radiation and undulators, and we'll be out of time soon, so maybe this is a good place to break. And next class, I'll start here. Um, but it'd be good, good time. I had some comments I wanted to make. Probably I forgot to make most of them. So I'll look at my list, but you might think of any questions you want to have on any aspect, how we're going to run the class or any of these slides, any of the physics we talked about. Uh, yeah, so I'm still open to suggestions you have with your feedback on um, how we can evolve how we run this class from previous years, where homeworks played a, a, a role, a, a certain role, level, a big role, class, particip class participation played a role, and your class projects played a role. But I think we want to, I think I'm getting from the feedback that more emphasis on the, your individual interests and your class projects, making that a bigger part, maybe a little bit less of me talking with lectures and more on your projects and maybe uh, less emphasis on the homeworks. And if you have ideas on any of these things, yes, I like it, no, I don't, um, how we might do it, we're open to this. And you might speak to uh, Defan and Leona to see what suggestions they might have. So feel free to contact them or me. Um, Again, there'll be a homework assignment tomorrow. And as Defan said, because this is the first one, he's gonna give two weeks to get it back in. Uh, if anyone's in a different time zone and there's any way I can help dealing with that, please let me know. Certainly the, with the recorded lectures now available, um, that may help. Um, also, uh, if someone has a qual coming up and you need, there's a lot of competition for your time as you prepare for the qual. Let me know so we'll see how we can and suggest any way that we can help you with that. 
Um, yeah, I think that's mainly the comments I had. Does anyone have any other comments? Okay, so we have to, we had <laughs> we had a few com we had a few questions and comments today. I think um, we're still going to go through this outline a little bit more, but uh, after we get through with the outline, I definitely want you to speak up more and bring in your own experience, what you would like to have explained better, or offer a better explanation yourself, just because you've also been working on this and you're here for learning about something different, but you do know about this, or you have a good question to ask, definitely want that to happen, okay? Okay, so all, all feedback is welcome. And then I think uh, it looks like we'll spend another lecture on this outline business, okay? And- uh, Your refresher? Yeah. Can I just ask, how much uh, of the course would you be spending on the spatial coherence discussion? Mm, not so much more than the others. I, in fact, not more than the others. So I think for each chapter, we'll probably have a few different lectures, like three or something like that. But um, I think it, it will depend a lot on how much people participate in that. So for instance, in the comments I got back from people, uh, some people said they were interested in it, but not too many are interested in, said they were interested in coherence. But if you want to understand scattering, you, there's a certain level that you better understand coherence, but it could be at a simple level. Okay. We don't have to beat it to death. Yeah. And for people who want to do, oh, nanoscale imaging with x-rays or something, yeah, coherence comes in quite strongly there. But um, I don't think we need to beat it to death, but I would like you to at least have the concepts of spatial and temporal coherence and how would we implement it. You, you'll see that um, coherence is described in a number of books in great detail, in, in, in uh, mathematically detail, where we're not going to go there at all. We are going to do mostly algebra. Okay, we're going to have concepts that make it, I think, pretty simple. Uh, and it will be simple if you ask questions. But if you don't get it, I can't see when, you know, if I look out at the class and I see that there are heads nodding positively, then I get the sense that people understand it. And if they're not, or they look like there's a glaze in everybody's eyes, then I know I'm not doing a good job. So I can't do that online. I just can't tell. So you just have to raise a lot of flags for me. Uh, it would be good, by the way, in each chapter, each chapter, the first few pages have been written to be understood by your mother and my mother, okay? The first few pages. So I want you to take those first few pages seriously. Then there's sometimes a mathematical development, which you may or may not want to follow. And then at the end of the chapter, there are applications again, and you can easily skip the middle part. And this is where I want you to exercise the best use of your own time. Where, what are you going to invest your time in? Reading topics, mathematical developments that you really don't have an interest in, or focusing on things that you do have an interest in. But we want to get the concepts right, and we want to see how whatever it is applies to your career, to your thesis, and your future job opportunities, professional developments. But I don't want you to feel that, because uh, there's a lot of places in the book where there's a lot of detail, but that's because there are people who read it who are interested in those details. But the the, the, the 11 chapters cover a lot of territory. So I think you have to pick out the ones that interest you. For the homeworks, we've said that you'll have two buys, meaning that you don't have to answer those, you don't have to do those homeworks. One of the things I was thinking, well, maybe one way to put more focus on what interests you is to have more effort going into the projects and less on the homework. So maybe we should increase the number of buys. Uh, so again, I'm completely open to suggestions. I'm looking for a way to make the class relevant to everyone who's in the class. Okay, so you can communicate with me at any time on how to do these different things. Uh, anyone else wanna throw out something? 
Okay, so I'll see you Tuesday, I guess, at 3.30. Okay, okay, bye.